So this session is a continuation of the one that um, um, occurred this morning. Uh, we have three speakers who will cover very quickly uh, a considerable portion of the waterfront of new and emerging uh, technologies that uh, uh, people are exploring and investing in here and elsewhere around the world. And uh, on my far right is Howard Morgan, uh, a professor of decision sciences at the Wharton School, but also for many years a very um, active uh, venture capitalist. Uh, sitting next to him is uh, uh, um, Steve Coonan, back by popular demand from this <laughs> morning. <laughs> and um, I will press button B. And Steve, who is the um, head of the Urban Institute uh, at uh, NYU, is um, going to give us a peek into the future of uh, fusion-based energy. And even though he doesn't look like it, the gentleman sitting to my immediate right uh, is the state geologist of uh, Texas, uh, Scott Fraser. And he's going to talk to the us. The other Scott. Scott Tinker. Scott Tinker. Right. Scott Tinker, I beg your pardon. That's all right. I'd rather My be Scott apology. Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look like Scott <laughs> Fraser. Um, he's going to talk to us about um, nanosensors, um, fracking, and uh, sequestering carbon. Um, and we're going to uh, do it like this. Howard's going to start, and he's going to give us a, uh, a bird's eye view into what's happening uh, in the world of drones. Okay, let me let's let's start. Uh, they're cheap, so you can you can spend uh, seven ninety five, four ninety nine for the Parrot, which comes out of France and is uh, sort of taken over the world. Uh, you can spend uh, eight hundred to two thousand dollars for DJI, a Chinese company, which is now kind of the leader in drones. And uh, what I want to talk about is sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So here's the good: uh, the movie companies are using them. They can get amazing shots. This is from the age of Ultron, uh, where shot by a drone as they were climbing the mountains. Uh, Amazon, Google, and a bunch of other people are getting ready to use them to deliver packages to you. And that requires some other technologies, because right now, GPS is good to a few meters. And of course, it, 10 feet, uh, if the package falls into your pool, you're not quite as happy. So we need a little tighter control on that. Uh, forest fires are being fought now by drones, and these are some drone copters spraying, uh, spraying a forest fire. So rather than put uh, human pilots in harm's way, not in the military side, but in the commercial side, uh, they're, they're being used in, 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 in very effective ways, both to, to fight forest fires and for surveillance of all kinds. What we've mostly heard about drones from first, and particularly because uh, President Obama is a, a big fan of them, uh, is the weaponization. Uh, these, these are uh, the Predator and the Golden Hawk and a bunch of, a bunch of these large, relatively large wingspan devices, uh, which can fire missiles. And they're operated uh, mostly by people in, in Crouch Air Force Base outside of uh, Las Vegas, uh, who are trained as youngsters in video games and who are really good at hand-eye coordination. And uh, they fly the drones, and as you see them in the movies, they drop weapons on people. And those weapons uh, actually do work. And that is, that is kind of the bad part of, of the whole thing. The thing that worries a lot of people is the invasion of privacy. Because you know, if you or your neighbor can buy a drone for a couple hundred bucks and, and start to fly it, uh, then you can fly it all over the place and, and look for things. Now, there are some problems. Uh, in terms of range, and there are some regulations coming out from the FAA. Uh, my friend Peter Bloom had a drone, and the drone is set so that if it loses radio contact with the controller, uh, it flies back to its starting point. Uh, however, uh, Peter had taken his drone from Ithaca to Brooklyn and uh, started flying the <laughs> drone, and the drone started going north. He lost contact, and the drone started to head for Ithaca without nearly the power to make it. And about a week later, he got a call from a friend who said, there's a Facebook picture of your drone in somebody's tree in this yard in Brooklyn. <laughs> and he went over and convinced the woman that he really wasn't trying to spy on her and got the drone back. But there are real problems with, 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 uh, with getting those drones. Uh, a big problem is accidents. I mean, uh, accidents will happen. 
They happen in big waves. These are you know, big drones crashing into people, killing people, in fact, unintended. Uh, we, you know, in, in the military, they've intended a lot of it. Some of it's been unintended. Some of them uh, it can cause problems, and particularly when they're operated by uh, teenage boys without much training in uh, avionics, they can have some real problems. So what are we going to see with respect to drones? Uh, first of all, regulation. So the, the FAA is trying to get the software that runs the drone's flight control to be uh, standardized and enforced. So we have an investment company called Airware, and they have teamed up with people, and there's a, a, an organization called noflyzone.org, where you can purportedly, you list the coordinates of your home, and you say, I don't want drones to fly here. And of course, there are quite a number. If you're a pilot, you know about no-fly zones. Those can all be programmed into the drone software so that the drone literally, the software will not let it fly over those areas. Now, can that be hacked and all that? We can argue about that. But for the mass market, there will be controls in the software which will keep drones from flying to some of the places they shouldn't. There's a question of where they should fly. So right now, the regulations are 400 feet limit ceiling and no closer than five miles to an airport. In the last couple of weeks, there were a lot of reports in New York at Newark Airport, pilots seeing drones in their flight path, flying at 1,000 feet or more on, on their approach to landing. Again, these kind of things can be built into and have to be built into controls for the drones. A lot of use by people like Amazon, Google, and that will help. But even more in package delivery, airware is being used in Africa to fly medicines to remote villages over the, the terrorists or the, the soldiers who are uh, otherwise taking a huge toll on getting that medicine through whether it's taxes, whether they just confiscate it, whether they shoot the messengers. Now you put the, the medicine on the drone, fly the drone to the remote location. Uh, they recharge it and fly it back. Some really good, good, interesting uses for it. And agriculture, in terms of actually getting good data about how crops are growing on a constant basis, that's going to be one of the biggest users for drones. The fact is the cat's out of this bag. You know, they're there. They're cheap. We're going to see lots of them. And it's something that we, we know that when you look up, you might see drones. But uh, even the predators have predators. Uh, start the video. So this is a drone. This is the view from the drone flying. It's a small, relatively small drone. Uh, and you'll see pretty soon that uh, there's an eagle. Mm. And the eagle takes down the drone. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what do you think the world of drones looks like a decade from now? I, I think a decade from now, uh, you, you will see them buzzing around farms for sure, all the time. You will see in rural areas, you'll see delivery, package delivery uh, of various kinds with drones in a decade. You'll see much, far fewer of them in cities and urban areas. You'll see some, but far fewer. Uh, I think the no-fly kind of regulations will be enforced in software, and that will keep them from some of the kind of worst places, if you will. I, the, the ACLU has sort of funny views as to what's privacy, what's private and what's not from the point of view of a camera, right? You, you, know, you can take pictures of anything happening on a public street, but, uh, and go, as Google has faced with their street view mapping, what can you take pictures of when it's through the window? And there are, there are certainly legal limits on that in many countries, not as much in the US, but some. And I think the drones are going to have to abide by those. Uh, and then you know, we'll have to worry about drones being used by the bad guys for all sorts of things. We, we, just parenthetically, we, I, with a firm that we, we're, uh, have been for quite a long time an investor in this company that Howard mentioned, DJI, that's based in uh, China, and it's extraordinary the number of applications these drones are going into. So for, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to weddings recently, but the standard now for any decent uh, wedding videographer uh, is to have a drone. <laughs> or if you are advertising a piece of particularly uh, suburban real estate, all the real estate sites now have uh, um, uh, drone-based uh, videos and photography on it, and believe it or not, roofing contractors are no longer going up ladders. They're um, using their little drones to go up and uh, 
inspect the lay of the land um, on, the, uh, on the top of the roof. Now, do you, either of you gentlemen, uh, Scott or Steve, have uh, questions for Howard on uh, the topic of drones? So, so uh, you know, looking to the future, you mentioned the possibility of, let me say politely, mischief with drones. <laughs> yes. Um, I think drone defense is an increasingly uh, interesting area to uh, society. How do we track, identify, and ultimately uh, disable uh, drones that are in flight without causing a lot of collateral damage? I think that's a very critical area. You, we've all seen the stories about the White House. There have been a few drones now that have gotten uh, over, in, over into the White House grounds, certainly. Uh, there are some automated systems for locating them, you know, with the radar type a location, not necessarily radar, but other, other things, video, visual, visual identification. One of the bigger problems in the military sense, uh, and Steve and I talked about this a little bit before, is you're not going to send in one drone if you're a foreign power. You're going to send in a swarm of them. And at the University of Pennsylvania, they've done a lot of work on coordinated swarms of drones. So they, they'll have 30 drone helicopters lifting very heavy objects. So each drone maybe can only lift a pound, but the 30 of them can move 25 pounds around. And they have all the software to coordinate all of that. But if you have 300 or 3,000 drones attacking a warship or attacking a tro some troops, then the identification, and you have to get every one of them. It's the same problem we had with MIRV, uh, MIRVs on our, uh, ICBMs, multiple independently retargetable stuff on the warheads. So I think there's going to be a lot of money and research to get, get us with good defenses on the military side and perhaps uh, for, the, uh, for law enforcement in general. The, the uh, photo you showed of the uh, firefighting yeah. drone, how big are those and how long, do you know how big they are or how long they stay in the air? Or the, which one, the, the, the ones that were being deployed <coughs> for firefighting. Well, for firefighting, uh, they're supposed to stay in the air for two hours. I forget which one it was, but it's one of the two hour uh, mm -hmm. ones. And it has, to, it has to carry a big enough payload to, uh, to, 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 to dump the smoke bombing and so on. We're actually using drones for geology. We fly them up steep wall outcrops and out over islands and put together photogrammetry and things. It's three-dimensional. It's fantastic. I guess my question is, given the continued decrease in size of things, um, if you're just doing photography, how small can we get drones? They don't have to be as big <laughs> as we see here. They could get... Mosquito size or what? Well, of course, if any of you who've read Neil Stevenson's books over the years know that uh, you know, uh, mosquito sized drones, and our DARPA has been funding mosquito sized drones uh, for photography. So, yes, they can get pretty, pretty much mosquito sized. A, a lot of it is battery. <laughs> you just of it hit is, by a drone. Yeah. Scott. Yes. A lot of it is battery <laughs> yeah. issues. I mean, because the, the, you can miniaturize the, the camera and the photo cell, it's yeah. the battery that's been the problem. Right. And so, uh, Hopefully, what JB was telling us before, maybe that will also impinge and give us better battery yeah. life for those. Scott, do you want to give us a peek into sure. your world and sure. uh, maybe highlight for the audience the different topics again that you're going yeah. to touch yeah. on? I'll do it on a slide. Can you fire up that next stat? So, <clears throat> they've, uh, I've been asked to talk about things coming in fossil energy. What are the possible disruptors here? So, let me get my clicker turned on and. So three important ones. Uh, I'm going to talk about enhancing recovery of oil and gas, and this is micro nano sensors in the subsurface. Talk about reducing the fracking impact, the environmental impact of fracking, and then finally uh, climate and carbon a little bit. What do we do with the carbon? So let's hit the first one. And I thought I'd pick a good philosopher from your region. Um, <laughs> so each of these will be preceded by a nice quote from Yogi. Uh, it ain't over till it's over with oil and gas. So let's start with that. 50 to 80 percent of the oil and gas in the world after all recovery technology has been deployed, gets left behind. So you know when you spill oil on your concrete floor in your garage, you can't get it out, and you can't get it out of rocks either, and they're more complicated. So how do you go about trying to get to that stuff? We started at something called the Advanced Energy Consortium about a decade ago, and I heard about smart dust. And I said, boy, that'd be cool. Let's get some smart dust and put it in an oil field. Turns out you can put it in human bodies, but the earth body's tougher. You can't, it's hot. It's high pressure and nasty chemical environments, and you can't see it, you can't cut it open. So well logs, uh, seismics between wells, and geophysics are the three areas of data collection for the oil field now. But if you want to get high resolution and farther away from the well, 
maybe we can put little things into that pore system. And again, these aren't big pools of oil down there, they're little holes. So we fund 25 universities around the world. This is an industry consortium, a lot here in the Northeast uh, to do this work. We're working on how do you move them, mobility. Um, contrast agents, can you put things into the, into the small pores that enhance the velocity or the electromagnetic measurements that are already taken? Um, nanosensors, materials that might change their state if they encounter a certain pressure or temperature or chemical environment. And finally, microfabricated sensors. And these are the little, small, smart things. And we went from a cubic, mil cubic centimeter when we started seven years ago. We're down to a cubic centimeter. And this little stack contains storage, a sensor, uh, retrievability, and will withstand pr Earth's pressure, temperature, chemical conditions. Not quite small enough yet, but it's almost a sand grain size. It's essentially a lab on a chip. So that's going to enhance recovery of oil and gas quite a bit as we move forward. Uh, fracking. C can we just pause there? A bit and, uh, I'm going to move so quick on my 10 minutes, Michael. I can't. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, I think we're allowed, I think we, I think we're allowed questions. Um, or at least the moderator is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think this means for the rest of us 10 years from now? The advances that you've just um, yeah. described here. So these kinds of sensors, much like drones, could be used for many different things. Uh, in a positive way, they could help us understand anything subsurface, so freshwater systems, for example. Um, better understanding of how to dispose of things uh, safely. Carbon sequestration, for example, or other kinds of chemicals or nuclear. Um, anything you can think about that goes on in the subsurface could help. But also, you know, potentially putting them into pipeline systems. So we could float smart, smart sensors down there and detect ahead of corrosion problems where you might lose a pipeline. Um, uh, other kinds of, of networks that move things around where you could put intelligent things mm -hmm. into them. Now, how widely deployed is this technology, albeit perhaps in its prior incarnation, uh, by the big oil companies today? Oh, how much do they support yeah. this? Completely. Yeah, yeah this, is, uh, this is an oil and gas industry consortium. Mm -hmm. Federal government is highly interested in it. We're working with Sandia Labs and DOE now to look at taking it from pre-competitive research into that prototyping, experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, demonstration, and then commercialization. Mm -hmm. So it's right on that path. Mm -hmm. Are any of the oil companies themselves further ahead in research here? Sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Some are. <laughs> Do you have a view on that, uh, <laughs> Steve? You used to work at a, a large oil company. Um, there were differences between the companies, but we don't talk about it in public. <laughs> yeah, it's a competitive thing for them. You know, I think that, that when you think about funding research like this, and then they compete fiercely in the, in yes. the, in the yes. workplace yeah. to deploy technologies, as they should. Right. So we kind of work the pre-competitive. Uh, if you're familiar with kind of technology readiness levels, it's TRL 1 through 3, maybe 4 or 5 to help transition I the see. competition. I see. Yeah. They're also using drones to scan the pipelines and to look for leaks and Absolutely. as well today. So Yeah. It's hit fracking. Half the lies they tell about me aren't true. So <laughs> who came up with that word, incidentally? I think it's about the worst possible. Fracking? Yeah. Yeah, we PR. were talking about. Yeah, it, it was actually the K was at. OK, so nuclear, which Steve will talk about, doesn't have a K either, but nukes does. Um, Fracking, hydraulic fracturing doesn't have a K, but frax does. It was first coined in, in the Times. Uh, they were the first to spell it with a, the dreaded K. And I'm sure we'll spell coal with a K someday, too, just <laughs> uh, whatever. But, coke uh, we could spell with yeah. a K. Yeah. I, I always yeah. thought it was a PR nightmare for anyone to yeah. defend a word that began with an F and ended in a G, but. Yeah, K, okay, yeah, it is. <laughs> we were talking about that in the genetically modified organism session earlier, too. You know, genetically modified, that's a PR nightmare. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, so uh, I love this comic. Let's, uh, we're going to start fracking under our biggest competitors. Headquarters plan is to pol uh, you know, pollute their water and generate earthquakes and destroy their campus. The project code name is Fracking Awesome. And uh, <laughs> Dilbert says, catchy. You know. So anyway, uh, I'll just show you something quick here. There's lots of things we could talk about, but one of them is surface footprint. When you put a lot of oil and gas wells, which shales require on the surface, it's, it's a quite a footprint. <clears throat> this is our sister campus. I'm at UT Austin, a professor there, but this is UT Arlington. And 
If you go down and look at that from the aerial view now, the, the green oval is that location of that well, and the shaded area is the campus. And you're looking at about four to five square miles of land here. And the campus said, no, you can't drill on, the, on our land. So off of this single platform, they took 19 wells. Okay? And they're called turnazonals. They actually went down and turned laterally and then turned again and accessed four square miles from a single pad. The scale of that, so you can understand, is like taking a nail, perhaps, a carpenter's nail, from the ceiling all the way down to the floor, hitting a quarter, turning it sideways and staying in the carpet, not out of the carpet, <laughs> all the way across the room and then down the side of the room. So that's called geosteering. And this is remarkable technology, the ability in rock that you can't see to stay within a spatial position. And there's no GPS coordinates down there. You know, it's not seeing down there like that is remarkable technology. Is, is this done with an operator? And yeah, uh, there are geosteers, and quite a few of them are geologists. They sit mm -hmm. at big, you know, uh, can, you know computer mm -hmm. um, consoles and, and steer. Engineers and scientists working together. So. This kind of thing, there are 16,000 wells drilled in the Barnett, divide by 20, 800. That's a really different surface environmental footprint. Roads, noise, dust, lights, all that kind of stuff. So that's the one I wanted to highlight. There are many, finally, climate and carbon. In theory, there ain't no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Uh, I looked it up this morning, hot off the press, uh, that pillar of... Uh, of science and definitions, Wikipedia, carbon dioxide is a colorless, odorless gas vital to life on Earth. Uh, that's the first sentence. You can do it yourself. So let's talk about it a little bit. I showed this yesterday. Uh, this is the global consumption of energy, green oil, red gas, gray is coal. Coal's been increasing, and it's from 28 to 31% of the global mix now. That's the actual data, and it's continuing to increase. The developed nations their CO2 emissions are shown here through time. The developed nation is largely flat. The developing nations were increasing and then increased much more steeply at the point of the Kyoto Protocol. That wedge, you can blame it on lots of things, but partly, I think it's hard to say it wasn't because you know, it has to be in part they weren't subjected to that protocol. Now, we can blame China and India for all sorts of CO2 emissions, bad, bad folks, but uh, you know we consume the stuff. So we are consuming the products that they produce, and it's a global challenge. So it isn't a China problem, it's a global problem. But this is the real data, this is where CO2 emissions are headed. So I call it the three E waltz, I've published on it and shown it in different ways, but healthy economies depend on secure energy, and we defined that yesterday. Energy underpins healthy economies. In part, we came out of the recession, it wasn't mentioned yesterday in the neat talk, neat, neat session on the global economy, but in part because of real cheap natural gas. Okay. Uh, environmental investment requires a healthy economy. So this little dance, this energy economy, environmental waltz goes on, and if you push too hard in the direction of any one of those, the, you, stamp on the you step on the dance toes of the other partners. And, and so we gotta be careful. Secure energy today is 87% of fossil fuels in the world, I just showed you the data. So in theory, carbon tax, cap and trade, or renewable portfolio schemes will accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to intermittent lower emission renewables, in theory. Uh, in practice, it's had little impact on the actual CO2 emission, the countries that have done it, okay? Cost, why? Cost, uh, pace, scale, uh, physics, thermodynamics and kinetics, uh, economic realities, they're very clear. And the markets have spoken, continue to speak very clearly on this. So the reality, my reality, which I'm happy to discuss, the world's not gonna re reduce CO2 emissions at anything close to the pace that's required to slow the anthropogenic component of global warming. Okay, I'm gonna let you read that for a second, and then I'm gonna run off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do we really do? If you're not gonna transition away from fossil fuels at anything close to the pace required to reduce this anthropogenic component of CO2 emissions, what do we do? Mentioned geoengineering yesterday. It was mentioned right here in the front row during Q&A. Atmospheric reflectors. Expensive and people are a little worried. You think you're worried about drones? Adapt <laughs> to climate change, I won't dive in. But I wanna mention carbon CO2. So capture CO2 from the emission sources, 
and or extract it from the atmosphere, and there are ways to do that today, and then store it. Store it until the next ice age when we're going to need it, okay? <laughs> we're going to want that CO2 back, and that's supposed to make you laugh, but, you know, it makes people in Texas laugh anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we weren't under ice ever, so, you know, um, unlike New York City. So what do we do? Um, so this is carbon capture and storage. You capture it, you compress it, you drill a well, you remove the, the emission stream and the stacks, you take the CO2 as a supercritical fluid and put it underground into old ocean water, the brine that's in small holes. And then you can put some of that CO2 into oil fields, which enhances the recovery of oil. One costs money and one makes money. Less money than it costs, but there's, there's a partnership there, okay? That's the simple diagram of CO2 sequestration, storing it in brine and using it some for enhanced oil recovery. Where to do this best? We've been looking at it all over the world, and we're really going now, and the DOE is helping to lead this, and I just signed a, an MOU in Washington about a month ago with China for putting, looking to put it offshore. Why would we do that? Well, there's a tremendous number of sources of CO2 onshore, right onshore, petrochemicals, refineries, power plants, hydrogen facilities, cement factories, and other kinds of things that produce a lot of the world's CO2. Offshore are huge piles of sediments that you could put the CO2 into old salt water and store it for a long time, okay? So the juxtaposition is very good, and this map shows that. This is my last bit. Uh, so what's the positive? It's nationally owned, single owner, which matters, and managed. The governments own it. You can match the emissions with their storage sinks. Large capacity, I've mentioned. You can detect the leaks. When things bubble off in water, you see them, okay? Um, and, and it's non-damaging, unlike under perhaps a city. Reduces the geopolitics then. Uh, everybody can play. China, Brazil, Russia can all play. India. You can measure, monitor, and verify that it's there. Downsides, really expensive. Everything is going to be expensive with carbon. It was pretty nicely explained, I think, yesterday in, in the discussion on climate change. And then the last downside, the volumes we're talking about here make the oil and gas industry, the amount of fluid they handle, look like preschool. So 35, 36 gigatons a year, billion tons. So that's my last bit. I got to show up my private airplane. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks. <laughs> Scott, how, uh, how prevalent is uh, carbon sequestration today, and where is it being employed in its most advanced in incarnation? So it's not being done at scale today, mostly experimentally still. The US funded several, seven regional centers. We're part of two of them. We've put about five or six million tons away in a little field called Cranfield, Mississippi, Louisiana border. The first commercial project was put in place in Texas. Texas talks tough with the feds, but actually does a lot of things that Texas funds, and it's at, at the Paris coal plant, government industry partnership to capture the CO2 and put in oil fields. Um, we're right on the edge, I think, of doing some larger scale things, but I'm not going to kid you about the cost. I think that's really the big driver, is it's very expensive. It, and it's not just dollars. When you, when you capture the CO2 from a stack, you either have to put on a post combustion scrubbing system, which take, is an energy penalty, or you do it a chemical process. Um, you build a plant designed to do that from the beginning, and those are both expensive. So there's money and energy that it takes to capture, compress, transport, inject, store, measure, monitor, and verify. So that's one, been one of the big challenges, and the scale. You know, it, it's, uh, we've put millions of tons away. The oil and gas field company's been doing it forever, because it when you put CO2 into oil, it changes the way the oil and the rock interact, okay? So it releases more oil. So when you put carbon dioxide into an oil field, you get more oil. You don't always get more money. You sometimes spend more than you get out. And that's, but they've been doing it into oil fields, but there's just not nearly enough scale there to truly address mm -hmm. the, scale, uh, the, the global mm -hmm. challenge. And back to your previous topic on fracking. Mm -hmm. Again, give us a sense of the impact today in the United States of fracking and what sort of percentage of oil recovery today is being done by um, you know, the first, yeah. second generation of fracking technology. Sure. 
And the natural gas side, 60% of the natural gas produced in the United States today is because of hydraulic fracturing, 60%. It's turned, out the, and the price fell to sub three bucks. It was at nine, eight to nine bucks. So this happened very fast, faster than most expected. Um, shale is the most common sedimentary rock in the world. There are shale gas, shale oil reservoirs around the world. There are different politics that are required and regulatory schemes to get it. On the shale oil side, uh, we just passed four million barrels a day, which is almost half of the oil in the United States is coming now from hydraulically fractured shale. We import, for, for perspective, we import about a million barrels a day from Saudi Arabia. We're producing four million barrels a day from shale oil. So on the margins, it's mattered tremendously. The biggest resistance to it today in the world comes from, not surprisingly, Russia and the Middle East. They want to sell the cheap stuff first to markets before they go after the more expensive stuff. Don't blame them, but they have it. They have a lot of it, I think. That's just the facts, I think. Steve. So I was just going to set uh, a scale on the sequestration challenge uh, to supplement Scott's remarks. Uh, right now, I think the commercial market for carbon dioxide in the U.S. is about 60 million tons a year. Um, total U.S. emissions, let's say in round numbers, are six gigatons. Uh, power is 40% of that. So we would have to increase our ability to handle CO2 by about a factor of 40 or 50 relative to what we're doing now. Major industry. Yeah. So do you want to be... Uh, a little bit more optimistic and t educate us all on the on. That wasn't optimistic. No, 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 no. I'm talking to Steve. It Sorry, was educational. Sorry. I hope at least. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, on your on your your last. Sure. Remarks. So so and, uh, and to talk to us about fusion. Sure. So I'm I'm uh, seem to be a serial disruptor today since <laughs> I was on the morning panel, um, and I'm happy to pitch in extemporaneously on a subject that uh, I know well and have been involved in shaping over the last two decades which is fusion energy. Uh, that's an important subject in the context that Scott just laid out, where the world is going to need reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy, and fusion is one such possibility. We have known for about 80 years that we could get enormous amounts of energy out of nuclei, the nucleus in each atom, probably a million times more than we can get by the chemical reactions that we use today to get almost all of the world's energy. There are two ways to get energy out of the nuclei. The first is fission, which was the first to be exploited when Enrico Fermi created the first nuclear reactor in the early 1940s. That industry was grown in the US and now provides about 19% of US electricity comes from nuclear reactors. Um, it has its downsides. In particular, the fragments that come from splitting apart the uranium nuclei are radioactive. They result in a waste that lives for a long time, need to be handled carefully, and at the moment is just sitting on the sites of the reactors waiting to be stored at some future time underground when the politics aligns that we can do something like Yucca Mountain. The other way of getting energy out of nuclei is not to take a large nucleus and fission it into two pieces, but to take two small nuclei and fuse them together, uh, making a bigger nucleus and releasing energy. This is the energy that powers the sun. It's best done by using very small nuclei, since you need to overcome the electrical repulsion between them. And so typically, it involves hydrogen nuclei. The way in which you do it is to create a hot gas of hydrogen, temperatures comparable to what's in the sun or more. And the, as the nuclei run around very rapidly in that hot gas, sometimes they bang into each other and they result in a fusion and energy being released. So the challenge is to create and sustain a confined volume of hot gas for some amount of time in order to get enough energy out of it. The US is producing, is pursuing that, and has been for quite a long time, as pursuing that sort of approach by three different technologies. The first, which is to use magnetic fields to hold the hot gas together 
in a donut-shaped vessel called a tokamak, which was invented in Russia, uh, I believe, in the 50s or 60s. Uh, the current incarnation of that is an enormous project called ITER, I-T-E-R, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is a project involving, I believe, six international partners, US, EU, Japan, Russia, China, and maybe somebody else I can't remember. Um, it uh, has broken ground. It, the site is in Cadarache, France. Think of the donut as being roughly 100 feet in uh, diameter, that scale. Um, the project started out eight years ago or so, maybe a bit more, costing about $10 billion total. It has now grown to $50 billion as a result of, let me just say, a very confused international management to bring six countries together <laughs> on a complex technical project. Each of them wanting to get more out of it than they put in uh, is a challenge. Uh, and the project has suffered for that. It's also been delayed. It won't start making even just demonstrating fusion until the end of the next decade, uh, which is some years behind as well. Um, this project, ITER, will not even make energy. Uh, it needs to lay the groundwork for yet a bigger project uh, afterward, which is expected to get started in about 19, uh, 2035 or so. So that path is going to be a long, slow path uh, if we're going to see energy at all out of fusion. The second path that the government is pursuing is uh, what's called inertial fusion, inertial fusion energy. And the largest incarnation of that is a very large laser, the National Ignition Facility, which is operating now. It, it took about 20 years to get it going. I was helpful at the beginning to get that going in the mid-90s, uh, in which you take 192 precisely balanced and precisely timed beams of a laser that focuses down on a capsule about half a centimeter in diameter, which is filled with hydrogen nuclei. The lasers deliver a lot of energy in a very small space in a very short time. They heat and compress the capsule to the hydrogen to the point where it will ignite, uh, produce fusion, and then the energy comes out into this big target chamber, which is 10 meters in diameter. Energy from that, uh, we have not yet succeeded in getting more energy out than we are putting in, although progress is, is good and rapid. There are technical challenges. Um, if we were to make energy out of it, we're going to have to go from one shot every eight hours to about 10 shots a second. And one can say that's just engineering, but in fact, it is a significant <laughs> challenge to make that work. Again, I would say 20 years at the earliest before we can imagine even thinking about putting power into the grid. The final uh, approach that's being pursued in the US by a private entity, actually, called Tri-Alpha Energy, and I will, full disclosure, I'm on their scientific advisory board and have been for about a decade, um, is to uh, pursue a linear geometry, not a, uh, a donut, but a straight line in which you use magnetic fields to combine the, confine the uh, gas, uh, but also not to fuse hydrogen nuclei, but rather protons and borons. And that sounds kind of exotic. Why would you want to do that? When you fuse the hydrogen nuclei together, you make neutrons. And neutrons are part of the problem, part of the waste. They activate the material around it and so make disposal problems, if you like. Whereas a proton fusing with a boron just makes helium, and so you don't have that problem. Um, I can't say too much about how the company is doing other than that I've not resigned from the Scientific <laughs> Advisory Board, uh, and I actually expect that you'll hear more about them in the next um, couple months as they um, start to be a little more prominent. Um, finally, you know, if we get to the point 20 to 25 years hence, where you can actually make electricity out of fusion, you have to ask the question of will it be adopted or not? And one of the things you have to understand about electricity, as is true in the case of fuel molecules, is it's a commodity. And that means that producers will go to the logos cost way of producing these things, of producing electricity in this case. Uh, so it's not enough to just make fusion work. It's got to be cheap enough 
to compete with the uh, other ways of producing electricity, including fusion, solar, wind, carbon capture and storage, and so on. So whether it will actually play a role in our energy future remains to be seen, but right now it's a very interesting research subject of a potentially disruptive technology. Thank you very much for that very quick overview, um, which uh, reminds me that we're going to have to figure out how to pay for all of this. And Howard Morgan has come up with a, a way to do this, which he's going to tell us about. And this delves into a much debated uh, topic in the technology and investment universes over the past year, which or 18 months or so, which is the emerging potential role of cryptocurrencies. Yes, yeah, so l let me say a little bit about it. Uh, many of you have heard of Bitcoin, but basically instead of uh, a paper backed by a government, which is fiat currency, uh, it's more like a commodity, like gold. It's in the form of a string of bits stored in a computer that can be traded. You can think of them as the serial number on a dollar bill, and then you throw away the bill, and you just move the serial number around, and uh, you do it in a way that's uh, very sophisticated in terms of cryptography, so that you, you can have fraud, et, et cetera. And this uh, was invented or create, conceived of quite a while back uh, by a shadowy figure. Uh, nobody quite knows who he is. There's been a lot of uh, attempts to out who, the, the, the Nakamoto, the fellow who wrote the original papers. But it spawned an industry. And how do you get a Bitcoin? You mine it in the same way that you mine gold? Well, not exactly the same way. Uh, you solve a cryptographic problem. So when he created Bitcoin, he said there will be 21 million of these strings of bits. They're called Bitcoins. They're 64 bits long. And each one of them is worth uh, something, but you get it by taking a lot of electricity and a lot of computing power. And they release new, by solving a cryptographic problem. So basically, the Bitcoin Foundation puts out a problem to be solved. People around the world vie with their computers to be the first to solve the problem. If you're the first to solve the problem, you get a, a Bitcoin. Uh, when it started, there were very few people doing it. Uh, they were putting out a lot of Bitcoins uh, at the beginning, and it didn't take much computing power. And as a result, the people weren't spending much money to mine them, so the Bitcoins had a value of 10, 15, 20, 25 cents. And then it got harder and harder. There are now sort of 11 to 12 million of the Bitcoins in circulation, and it's getting harder and harder to get a Bitcoin. The problems become harder. This is a graph of the computing power that it takes uh, to get a Bitcoin, which is worth a couple hundred dollars this, this week. It's been up to about $1,000. Uh, it started down as close to zero. Uh, but it's traded really in the sort of $150 to $1,000 for the last year and a half. Uh, most of this mining is now done by computer servers in Iceland, where they can get very cheap power. Uh, it takes a lot of power to do it. Uh, the mining part's kind of uninteresting because it's really a consortium of people doing it, and there's not a lot of money being made today. There was a lot of money made in the first couple of years. Uh, so what are the uses uh, of this whole thing? So. There's sort of three things. One is uh, you can move bitcoins around by sending them on a computer. And importantly, the way that bitcoin works is that each bitcoin carries with it a ledger of every transaction that has been made with that bitcoin. Think about it as if every time you spent a dollar, uh, you wrote on the dollar, OK, I, I just bought a, a, a pack of gum at Bill's, and then Bill writes on it, OK, now I'm, I just used that to get a ride on, on, in, a, in a subway at, in New York City. And NYC Transit says, OK, we just used this to pay uh, 1 40th of the salary of somebody. And it, every time that dollar is used, that Bitcoin is used, or, or fractions of it, uh, that is recorded in the ledger. The ledger is sent out publicly. A bunch of people have to verify it and store it separately. So it is a verifiable ledger of everything that has happened with that Bitcoin. Uh, so what, what, are the, what, is, what does that mean? There's all sorts of interesting financial services, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And then uh, there, there are ways to reduce dramatically the costs of financial services. Because right now, there are big costs for using credit cards. There's a big infrastructure with credit cards. There, there are big costs for wire transfers. 
for remittances and so on. Of course, the governments are concerned because they now have less control. How, uh, how there is no Fed uh, that is putting out money. One more minute, OK, and because yeah. then we've got to get some We questions. are going to get tight. Yeah. OK, so you can use it for cheap, cheap transfers around the world. The real key and what's exciting most people is you can transact with people you don't know. And you can trust them because everything is recorded publicly. So everything that's done with this Bitcoin is publicly recorded. It got a bad reputation because what was it used for first? Well, it was used first for people buying drugs. Uh, and it was a very easy way to move money around the world and buy drugs. Mostly that's been stopped. Um, how does it disrupt your future? Will it affect you? It'll be hidden inside of other products that you use. Uh, our company, Abra, says that if you have a, uh, a uh, somebody uh, who is, or if somebody is working in the US, uh, maybe they're foreign, maybe they're a, a, a legal immigrant or illegal, doesn't really matter, but they want to send money back to their relatives in Mexico or in the Philippines or someplace. Right now they go to Western Union, Western Union charges them 15%. Their relative goes to the Western Union office uh, in, the, in the Philippines and gets money back. Uh, with Bitcoin, with Abra, you go to, you, on your app, your app says, Bill right near you is, is accepting transfers to the Philippines. You give Bill $50, he sends an email to the, to the system which finds somebody, sends an email to your, your relative in Manila or in, uh, in Mexico City and says, you now have $50. Uh, here are the people near you who can give you that money in pesos. You go to the, one of those people, they take <coughs> the transfer and give you the, your money. That's all done internally with Bitcoin. $50 gets translated to Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is sent internationally. And instead of paying 15% to Western Union, you pay 2% to Abra. They pay 1% to the human teller who's doing the work and, and keep 1%. Dramatically reduced friction in international money transfers. That's kind of the biggest thing. I think you're, I, mean, I, I think we need to finish. Yeah, well, this is, this, is, this, is yeah. The last, this is the last piece. So basically, all kinds of disruption in verification, in Tracking and, pra and protecting fiat currency, you can actually track real dollar bills on that blockchain. And all this was predicted by Neil Stevenson in his 1999 book, Cryptonomicon. Great. Mm. That's a, a fascinating new sphere that's just opening up. Uh, what about uh, turning up the lights and we'll see if there's some questions? Yes, right at the back. Why should Bitcoin have any value, Howard? Uh, it's not backed by anything except people trusting one another uh, for the value, the same way that wampum beads have value. They're not backed by anything either. Uh, or U.S. paper currency right now, which is backed by faith and credit, but not gold anymore. There was a question at the back there. A question to uh, Scott about uh, storing CO2. Orders of magnitude, what would the cost of a program be? Because you said it's, I mean, it's tremendous, but is it sort of one Iraq war, is it? Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, you know, you, it ranges all over the board, but I'll say it this way. It will add at least 50% to the cost of electricity from coal today, and probably closer to doubling the cost of, a, of an electron, a kilowatt hour from your coal. So, and some might say, good, you know, that puts it cool competitive with other things and, and you know, fair enough, uh, however you want to think about that. But again, if you think about the tonnage, let's say we're actually approaching 40 billion tons a year now, global CO2 emissions, um, you know, to put a million tons of something in the ground, it, it takes a lot of money. So it's, it's a bunch of dollars. Now, as things will scale, economies of scale, you get industries set up, compression and transport and things. So com competition, everything comes down. But it's a big commitment. Uh, that would be a global commitment to that particular strategy. But if you're going to look at carbon reduction, in my scenario, that's really one of the main options. Other questions? Um, why don't you just put a big tax on oil to reduce uh, usage or big tax on carbon? Yeah. Um, and good, you know, great discussions on that, and we'll all have different opinions about it. Um, I, essentially, that's tax, you know, tax on us. We'll all pay for that. And if the world wants to do that consistently, fair enough. Um, those countries who have tried it so far, 
it, or cap and trade, uh, both. It created a lot of uh, arbitrage and money making for those in the middle, and CO2 continued to go up into the air. So Europe, let, yeah. can I just weigh in on the tax for a second? Yeah. If the, even if the US decided to do it unilaterally, let's say we're doing 5 billion tons a year and let's say $20 a ton, that's $100 billion a year of tax revenue. That's not chicken feed. However, you have to trust that Congress will distribute that revenue in a way that uh, neutralizes the poor folks, the impact on the poor folks, and is generally responsible in the way it distributes that revenue. I'm not so sure we have enough precedent to have that trust. <laughs> and by the way, $20 a ton wouldn't do it. I don't think it would motivate it enough. It's going to have to be more than that per ton to really have it cause an effect big enough to create scale, CO2 sequestration at scale. So I have to press the pause button here. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank Scott Tinker, <laughs> Steve Coonan, and Howard Morgan for giving us a glimpse into their respective futures. Thank you.